Well, welcome to our Easter Sunday morning service. So glad you could be with us today on what is described as Resurrection Sunday morning, where we celebrate our risen Saviour, Jesus. And my message today is called Found, Forgiven and Reconciled. Three aspects to this story of Jesus, His death and His resurrection, that I believe are so significant to our faith. And so we're gonna unpack those a little today. We're going to uh, share in some stories of people from our church who've had experiences with Jesus that have radically changed them, where they have been found, where they've been forgiven and they've been reconciled to God. So today, hey, we celebrate our risen Saviour, Jesus Christ. But the question is, what does His resurrection really mean to us? What does it mean to you and to me? Is Easter simply a religious observance uh, that, you know, has no bearing on my day-to-day -day life? I, I come along on a uh, Easter Sunday because that's what I should do. But is there more to it? Could it be that this resurrection of Jesus means something? Does it have any personal meaning to my life, to my story, to my situation, to what I'm facing in my daily life? You know, the Bible is full of incredible stories. And as it's Easter Sunday, we're gonna focus on a story about Jesus. A story about Jesus at a time of tragedy, a time of real emotion, yet also a time that ultimately ends in celebration and victory beyond the pain of the moment. And uh, this story is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And it's about Jesus and a friend of his who died. The reality is Jesus had friends like you and I. His friend's name was Lazarus. I don't know if you have a friend named Lazarus, but Jesus did. And Lazarus had two sisters, Mary and Martha. Now in this story, Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick, but he's not with Lazarus, he's in another village. The thing is, he doesn't go immediately to him. He waits or stays two more days when he, where he is. And when he finally gets to the place where Lazarus is, Lazarus has died. The people there are grieving. His sisters are mad at Jesus. They're grieving, they're mad, they're angry, they're accusing him. People are throwing guilt on him, projecting all their pain on him. In fact, in John 11:32. Uh, one of the sisters of Lazarus says, if you'd been here, Jesus, this would not have happened. I don't know if you've ever felt that weight of that guilt on you. If you'd only been here, or maybe you've put it on yourself. If only I'd been there, that wouldn't have happened. If only I'd done this differently, that wouldn't have happened. And we can live in this regret, this guilt, feeling like we should have been there or we should have done something else. And Jesus is getting all this accusation and all the pain of the moment thrown at him. And he's also feeling his own pain because we read in John 11, two of these little verses that Jesus weeps. Jesus weeps for his friend. Jesus weeps because he's feeling real pain for his friend. Jesus feels the pain of everyone around him. He's feeling everyone's pain and his own pain for the loss of his friend. And you know, we, we feel like that, don't we, at times? Maybe we're feeling pain for our own circumstance. Maybe we're feeling pain for someone in our world who's experiencing pain. But in the middle of all of this, Jesus makes this statement, and it's a statement not just about Lazarus, but it's a statement about who he truly is and what he can do for anyone who believes in him. In the midst of pain and loss and tragedy and anguish, difficulty, even confusion, Jesus is still clear about His mission, His purpose, the plan of God the Father for all humanity. And Jesus says this in John 11:25. 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And now in this moment, Jesus isn't just talking about Lazarus, He's talking about all of us. He's talking about the fact that we are dead in our sin. We are separated from God. He is talking about this moment, but He's talking about a bigger moment that is going on. We are lost in a world that is trying so hard to make it work without God, a world that rejected God. And God steps in 
through his son, Jesus, and says, I am the resurrection and the life. In a moment of death, Jesus says, actually, I have come and I'm going to bring life. You know, today we celebrate Jesus, the Messiah, as John the Baptist called him or proclaimed, who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus, who weeps for a lost friend. In that moment, it's God saying, you know what? I'm weeping with you. Jesus, who allowed himself to be brutally crucified, is God saying, I am broken for you. And Jesus, who overcame the power of sin and death and rose again, is God saying, I am here to give freedom to you. Paul, who wrote a whole lot of the New Testament, writes to the church in Corinth about this moment, about Jesus' death and resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, 55. And he says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, He gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Paul wrote to the Colossians and he says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Jesus, who was counted out as we remembered and reflected upon on Good Friday by a death on a cross, has made a public spectacle. He was a public spectacle hanging there for all of us. He made a public spectacle of sin and death and triumphed over them. This Jesus is personal in his approach and powerful in his mission. And today on Resurrection Sunday, we draw near to this personal Jesus and we are changed by his resurrection power. Today, in the moments, the little bit of time that we have together, we're going to go on a journey exploring three individual lives and the power of Jesus as our risen Saviour and yet also our personal God who offers us freedom from our sin, our shame, our mistakes, our confusion, our hurt, our pain, and gives us the opportunity to find a new life, literally a new way of living. Isn't that amazing? found by God through Jesus is our first story, then reconciled to God and to others by Jesus, forgiven by God because of Jesus. So let's begin today hearing Rhoda's story of being found by God. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. Eritrea was beautiful, found in East Africa by the Red Sea. People will say it's a culture full of hope, hospitality, brotherhood, and sisterhood. My parents were always part of church and I loved to sing in the kids' ministry. But one day that all changed. With a shift in government came less and less freedom. Church started to close slowly and people would be taken for cautioning and you would never see them again. It was no longer safe for dad to stay, so he had to move to Sudan, visiting us whenever he could. We were vulnerable and that was no secret, a mom and three kids alone by herself. The home intrigation just kept coming and coming. And when the onslaught got too much, mom had enough. She wasn't safe in her own country. Once the escape was in motion, the people transporting us demanded more money and then more. We were at their mercy in a land that was in our own. Five of us sleeping on a mattress on the floor. And every time we lose the power in the house, I remember my mom would gather us together and make us recite Psalm 23. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And then one day, finally, we were free and reunited with Dad. It was a breakthrough, really, but in Sudan, we were never really at home. Doubts about the goodness of God kept crept in. 
Sometimes I actually wondered if he was there or if he was really listening to us. In a season of waiting, time goes really slow, and our season lasted five years. Eventually, our prayer were answered, and we resettled in Canada. We had safety, but in a new culture, you had to find your feet, your faith, and yourself all over again. When you finally get to settle down, that's when identity crisis creeps in. After everything I witnessed and experienced, God finally began to put dreams in my heart. But people were still dying. Eritrea was the same Eritrea that I left. Sometimes these dreams just felt so far away and very unrealistic. Over time, I felt drawn to come to Bible college. He said he's in it, so I just followed. One day, in the suburb of Sydney, in the midst of lockdown and online conference, sitting in my kitchen, just chilling, barely paying attention, to be honest, I heard a sound, the language of Eritrea. And not just random sound, this was a voice that I knew. It was a voice of Helen. When Eritrea was mentioned, my heart just jumped. Hearing our story told, I realized my dreams also can come true. If Helen can be seen in this big world, it made me feel like we are found. We were always found, and now I knew it more than ever. Here I was on my own, in this foreign country, and this is where God actually met me. And not only that, but slowly I got to meet myself. Rhoda found in Christ is bold, faithful, someone who's going to keep going even when things don't make sense. And I definitely acknowledge the bad and all the bad things that have happened in my life and in others' life, but nothing is bigger than God. He can resurrect anyone physically, spiritually, and psychologically. Surely His goodness and love will follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. For me, that's where I'm found. Well, how beautiful is Rhoda's story? All the way from Eritrea, God was with her in this incredible journey that she has been on. And I personally have a heart for Africa, so I love Rhoda's story. Jesus found Rhoda when she thought she was alone and God no longer cared or was interested in her. But he came looking for her and he does this for all of us in different ways. Right back in the beginning of God's story in Genesis, after Adam and Eve had sinned, they'd rebelled against God's plan. It says in Genesis 3 verse 9, but the Lord God called out to man, where are you? God knew that man had sinned and made a mistake here, but God still was wanting, longing to be with those He had created, to be with humanity. And just like Adam and Eve, He longs to be with us. Even though we at times have rejected Him and failed and made mistakes and sinned, which means we've missed the mark, Jesus said this in John 15, 16, "'You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. What amazing news that Jesus chose you and He chose me. It's not just that we were looking for Him, but that He was looking for us. I don't know if you've ever been on a, you know, at lunchtime at school, if you remember the moment when they were picking teams and you were kind of the last to get picked, and it's like, oh yeah, okay, you join our team, I suppose if we, yeah, you, come on. You don't feel very good, do you? You don't feel like you're really wanted, you're really valued, you're just like an extra. You're not an extra to God. You're not one who is just, oh well, okay, yeah, join if you have to. No, that's not how God sees you. He came looking for you because you are highly valued by Him. And you know, the image that I love is the one of the father in the story of the prodigal son, a story Jesus told to help us understand the father heart of God toward all of us. In this particular story, we see this father longing for his wayward son to return, a son who's messed up badly, wasted the inheritance his father had worked so hard for. Yep, he messed up and he's been in a bad way. And now the father is longing for him to come back. 
The father is not waiting in judgment for the son's return, ready to highlight all his faults and failures, to kind of point out all that, you know, what he's done wrong and what a failure and what a mistake he is. No, he's waiting in love for his son to return home. Home, hey? A place where he is loved and accepted unconditionally. And that's exactly what home should be. We have the sign that says, welcome home, because we want to create a church environment where people feel that love and acceptance. In Luke 15, 20, we read about this moment where the father is reunited with his wayward son. In Luke 15, 20, it says, so he, the son, got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son. What a beautiful image that is. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. And he doesn't stop there. It says the father goes on to say, let's celebrate my son has returned. Literally, my son who I thought was dead is alive. He doesn't hide his son. He doesn't disown his son. He doesn't focus on his son's failure. He celebrates. And we read this in Luke 15, 21. It says, The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring and put it on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. They obviously weren't vegans. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Today is Resurrection Sunday. It is a day of celebration. Jesus is our risen Saviour. He rose again and that is worth celebrating. And He wants to celebrate you. God is celebrating you on this day because you can return home. He has made a way for you and for me to return home to the Father, to experience His unconditional love and grace, to walk in the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus because He came looking for us. Wow, what a special, significant day. And right now, I want us to be encouraged by Ori's story. Ori's found and forgiven by Christ. And this is a really powerful story. Let's enjoy it together. I didn't grow up in church, but I did grow up in a happy family. We lived in a beautiful house with big gardens outside of Melbourne. Dad was a plasterer. He loved photography. He always made us laugh. He was Daddington. I was Orrington. Then, when I was six, we lost Dad. I didn't fully understand, but I knew he wasn't coming back. I unconsciously closed myself off, and that was the start of a bad path. I got expelled from school, became aggressive, and violent. By 20, I was dealing drugs, soon fell into addiction myself. My brother and cousin had become Christians. I saw a glimpse of what Jesus had done for them. They said, maybe God could help me too. That Sunday, I found myself in church. I gave my life to Jesus, but God wasn't my priority. I was heading so fast in the wrong direction, I didn't know how to turn around. I packed my car, started driving to the Gold Coast desperately hoping for change. Late one night, sitting in my car, I was brought lower than I thought I would go. I wondered if my life was over. But that's when I remembered. I had already given it to Jesus. And I just said, God, I gave my life to you. If you are real, reveal yourself to me. This isn't living, I need you. Right at that moment, I changed the radio station. It was the same song played in church the day I gave my life to Jesus. I felt a burden lifted and God answered and he said to me, yeah, life's been tough, but it doesn't have to continue like this. And at that moment, I knew he was real and I broke down in crying. I hadn't cried in years. That Sunday, I walked through the doors of the church. I planned to get there right on time so I could sneak in and sneak out straight away but my time management wasn't always the best. I got there 15 minutes early. 
I was pacing up and down the hallways. Then a guy came up to me and said, hey man, what's going on? I just shared with him and he was like, do you want to come sit with me today? I wasn't out of place. I kept turning up, still addicted. I knew it was wrong, but I never felt judged. It was a Friday night when I got baptised. All I knew is that I was publicly declaring my faith, saying goodbye to my old life, becoming a new creation in Christ. As I held tight to that revelation, I felt something shift. By God's grace, I was finally free from addiction, got a job and found my way in life. I had a passion for helping people. I wanted to be a light, but I found myself caught up with the wrong crowd. Eight months after my mountaintop moment, I was back in addiction and away from church. My mental health hit rock bottom. I ended up in hospital for months. It was rough, but through it, God lit up the path that he knew I needed to take. In rehab, I began to mature and understand God's forgiveness. It's always been easy for me to forgive other people, but I'm so hard on myself. One day, the Holy Spirit prompted me, why don't you forgive yourself? The past is past. I don't have to keep repeating it. After that revelation, every day was fresh. I knew that I just had to keep on showing up and shaking the shame off. It's been a crazy couple of years, but being in church, going to Bible college, pursuing the dream of helping others gives me so much joy and hope. I know I wouldn't be where I am today if Jesus hadn't carried that cross. Again, hey, Ori's story, wow, all about a life being changed by Jesus. And you know what, Ori's story is one that I think relates to all of us when he says, it's always been easier for me to forgive other people, but I'm so hard on myself. One day the Holy Spirit prompted me why don't you forgive yourself? And maybe this is where you're, you're at today. You're struggling to forgive yourself. You can forgive others, but it's hard to forgive yourself. You get down because of the reg regret you feel over your past. Can I just say this? None of us can change our past. I know we all wish there was a time travel device. You know, we could, uh, you know, get in the DeLorean and, and go back in time with the professor and change things. We can't do that. We can't go back to the future. But you know what? We don't have to live in our past. The death and resurrection of Jesus reminds us that our past is forgiven and our future is secure with Him and in Him. And that's what baptism represents, leaving the old nature, our old life under the water and coming up as a new creation in Christ Jesus. Paul said it like this to the church in Corinthians, the, the Corinthian church, 2 Corinthians 5.17. I love this verse, one of my favourite ones. You probably know it. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. On Resurrection Sunday, we are reminded that our past is forgiven and not just forgiven, it is washed away. There is a whole new life with God waiting for us to enjoy, explore and step into. We have a new life because of Jesus' sacrifice. He restored our relationship with God, our Heavenly Father. But not only does He restore our relationship with God, He also works to restore our relationship with others. 2 Corinthians 5 in the message, paraphrase translation says it like this. Because of this decision, we don't evaluate people by what they have or how they look. We looked at the Messiah that way once and got it all wrong. As you know, we certainly don't look at Him that way anymore. Now we look inside and what we see is that anyone united with the Messiah gets a fresh start, is created new. The old life is gone, a new life emerges. Look at it. All this comes from the God who settled the relationship between us and Him and then called us to settle our relationships with each other. God put the world square with Himself through the Messiah, giving the world a fresh start by offering forgiveness of sins. 
Wow. God has given us the task of telling everyone what He has done. We're Christ's representatives. God uses us to persuade men and women to drop their differences and enter into God's work of making things right between them. We're speaking for Christ Himself now. Become friends with God. He's already a friend with you. Isn't that beautiful? He's already a friend with you. God is all about reconciliation of relationships. Firstly, ours with Him, and secondly, ours with others. So let's allow this final crazy, because it's kind of a crazy story, shed some light on God's ability to reconcile relationships to, to Him and to others. This is Margaret's story. I was a 60s girl, just 17, when Fred drove us to a party one night. Now, Fred, he wasn't flashy like other guys I'd gone out with. He was calm and composed, a bit of a closed book. I'm all about communication. And who doesn't like a challenge? Now, he liked that I was fun and a bit of a leader. Later, he would say that I made him feel comfortable being himself. But the truth is, I wasn't comfortable being me. On the outside, I looked great. But on the inside, life had broken me. I'd grown up knowing about a God. Somewhere out there, he knew me. But I definitely didn't know him. So Fred and I didn't get married in a church. Instead, I arrived at the registry office in my white velvet suit that my big sister had made, and we signed the paperwork and went shopping. And then we had our precious daughter, Jane, who brought us so much joy. Throughout this season, Fred was amazing. But there was communication breakdown, compounded by my insecurities and real challenges in family and life. If you don't give things attention when they need it, they don't work. We filed for divorce and started building separate lives. I was then diagnosed with cancer. I was so cross. I found myself alone and heading for a lumpectomy. I felt a complete failure. I was divorced, I was sick. I felt, I can't do this, but I was stubbornly resolved to make it on my own. <laughs> but Fred being Fred, of course, he offered to move back in and look after Jane while I was in hospital. When sickness takes your life to its limits, it leaves you wondering, what if this had been the end? When I came home from hospital, we had a very real conversation. And Fred asked, as he does, the real questions. <laughs> what do you want to do? The truth was, I wanted to travel around Europe in a camper van. So we went, the three of us. On our travels, we crossed paths with Americans who invited us to church. There was no way I was going, and neither was Fred. But you know what? In the end, their kindness led us there. They were just so kind. The man at the front of the church, who was not even wearing a white collar, claimed to have heard from God. It seemed like madness. And when the service was ended, he invited people to come forward to the altar. I closed my eyes, resting assured that calm and composed Fred wasn't going anywhere. But then I felt him get up. Opening my eyes in disbelief, I saw Fred making his way to the front with Jane close behind him. I was like, no way are they going to heaven without me. Now I got up for all the wrong reasons, but by the time I reached the front, wonderful Holy Spirit touched my heart. And I knew, I really knew I had a saviour. His amazing grace. How sweet the sound that you could save a wretch like me. I once was so lost, but now I'm found. I was so blind, but now I can see. We were baptised in the sea with our past washed out in the waters. And we were reconciled to Christ as a whole family. Finally, I could say it is well with my soul. And if your soul is well, you can face anything. We read our Bibles cover to cover, cover to cover. I prayed in tongues for days at a time. 
We saw healings in church and miracles in our own lives. Decades later, Fred is still calm, sees what I don't see. He tells me the truth and also releases me to be me. He knows I love him unconditionally. Our second wedding was all about Jesus, a dedication to walk out salvation together. Even if it got difficult, we made that choice right there that we would never, ever do it without him. Because you know, those who've been forgiven much really do love much. And being reconciled for me means forgiveness, being found, having true hope and eternal salvation. It was grace that brought us safe thus far. And you know what? It's His grace that will lead us home. Well, how beautiful are those stories. I am with the amazing people who these stories have been about. It is great to be with Margaret, who we just heard her story of being reconciled back with Fred. How good <laughs> is that? Because of Jesus. Totally. Uh, I love that story. And Ori, hearing your story of finding Jesus and everything you went through in your life. And now here you are and you're at Bible college, yeah. and God's at work in your life in beautiful, amazing ways, and Resurrection Sunday, yeah. I mean, what a day to celebrate Jesus. And Rhoda from Eritrea, yeah. I mean, here you are. How, what an amazing story that God found you when you probably felt like, does he even care about yeah. me? But he, he does. Yeah. And, um, and I just love every one of these stories. They've been so amazing. So, hey, we are celebrating Resurrection Sunday because we have a risen Saviour. And he's personal, as you've heard from these different stories, yet he's powerful. He looks after, he looks out for us. Why? Because he loves us. We're found by him. He forgives us because He wants to know us and walk with us. He reconciles us to Himself because without Him, we mess up. But with Him, we can journey well through this life. With Jesus, we build healthy lives, healthy relationships, and we live for something greater. He, in His wisdom, graced and designed us for this life. And so we wanna live for Him. And that's what knowing Jesus is all about. Jesus, what a beautiful Saviour, what a beautiful Lord, who because of His death and resurrection, brings us into a brand new relationship with God. So thank you for joining us today. And uh, now at every location, we're gonna stand, we're gonna worship, and we're gonna celebrate Jesus, our risen King together. God bless.